Welcome to the Build Business Acumen Podcast, where we deliver practical knowledge and powerful guidance. Here is your futuristic host, Nathaniel Schooler. Today, I'm joined by Paul Feese, and he's a commercial storyteller, connecting people, perspectives, and profitability. He spent nearly six years with Thomson Reuters, and over the last 10 years, he has won lots and lots of awards. This is certainly a man who is worth listening to. Thanks so much for joining and make sure that you review and uh, give me a five-star review wherever you're uh, you're listening. I'd really appreciate that and share with your friends. Now let's get into the show. Well, commercial storytelling in the age of big data is a fascinating subject actually. So I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just jump in and ask you a question, if you don't mind, because I've got a few, few questions that we prepared earlier, clearly. And um, we, we live in an age where massive amounts of content and data are generated on a daily basis, right? So what, what do you think are the keys for business communicators looking to differentiate their material? So let me start off with a couple of statistics, uh, which I think are really telling about the world in which we live. And it kind of paints a picture of the environment that the modern businesses uh, operate in and, and modern professionals live in. You know, So um, Forbes and IBM have reported that we produce somewhere in the neighborhood of 2.5 quintillion bytes of data every day. Uh, the consulting firm McKinsey speculates that by 2020, so you know, basically a year from now, each person will generate 1.7 megabytes of data every second. And uh, the International Data Corporation uh, states that by you know, 2020, global data usage will reach 44 zettabytes. Now, a zettabyte, for those who don't know, and I didn't know, but a zettabyte is a picture of one with 21 zeros behind it. Uh, it's just it's staggering the amount of data that is generated. And, you know, at some point, we're going to live in an age where artificial intelligences will be, you know, much more uh, practical, less theoretical. They'll, they'll really be uh, interwoven into the fabric of our lives. And, you know, AIs will be built to be able to contend with that amount of data. But humans, human mind, you know, the relationship between information and comprehension is not an infinite track. You know, at some point, information, you know, our ability to process information will buckle. And I, I would say that that's where art comes in, is that at some point, and you think about like just all the emails and all the content that you encounter in your day, you know, your, your mind realizes it can't just take it all in, it has to filter it. And, you know, there are certain things that resonate with you uh, that you kind of, you know, drill down on. And so I think in, in a world like that, um, it really becomes the art of storytelling in, in the age of big data it becomes very important. Um, you know, you've got lots of firms out there doing very smart things with keywords and, you know, trending topics and stuff. And it's very easy to get kind of pulled into, you know, the undertow of, of those, those topics. And so you have to find a way that your content surfaces and, um, you know, kind of stands out. And I think some of the way that we do that, that I think the secret to that is, is focusing on, on people. At the end of the day, you know, as creatures, you know, our, our primary interest is in other people. Um, you know, stories, storytelling, you know, movies, books, all of that, you know, our, our hunger and our um, appetite for stories has, has, has never abated. And, you know, so I, I really think that that's the secret that, you know, commercial enterprises really should leverage is that is focused on, on telling human-based stories. And when you do that, it, it inculcates trust in your organization. Um, it inculcates interest. And, you know, people, people want, like, fascinating solutions but they want more so they want to hear the human stories behind those fascinating solutions so i think 
as a, a business communicator, if you can uh, really focus on like how your people are doing interesting things, um, that's the way to tap into the, the hearts and minds of your customers. Yeah, yeah. I agree with that. I mean, I, I found some figures actually on, 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 uh, I would call it sort of corporate communications merging with personal communications, right? I mean, that's in essence what we're sort of talking around here. It's kind of the, the people and how they communicate to the outside world from that, from that particular business. And I mean, for example, I've got some figures here from entrepreneur.com and mm-hmm. They, they said that actually leads developed through, through employees from social media convert seven times more frequently than other leads. Mm-hmm. And sales reps who use social media as part of their sales techniques outsold their peers by 78%. Mm-hmm. And 92% of people trust recommendations from people over brands. I think you're hitting on something, you know, again, that, that people are, are at the center of that. And it, it's not surprising that like social media recommendations, recommendations from people that, you know, are really what drive like the greatest amount of interest, greatest amount of leads in your sales funnel. And you take a look at, for instance, Edelman, the research firm. Uh, mm-hmm. Every year they do a trust barometer and they focus on like, you know, all kinds of uh, aspects of trust, trust in media, trust in information, trust in organizations, governments, etc. And, and parentally, uh, the barometer finds that like corporate employees, rank and file employees far outpace executives and C-suite, you know, professionals when it comes to you know, uh, audience perception of trustworthiness. People just, you know, it's like if you put your CEO out there with a message, you know, a, only a certain amount of people see that as a trustworthy vehicle for, for you know, delivering that information. But if you put like a rank and file employee, you know, they will, they outperform in an audience perception, outperform uh, in terms of trustworthiness. People just, you know, they feel like there's a greater authenticity. They don't feel like they're being sold to or that they're being fed a message, but they, 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 it resonates more. And right. so, again, I think that comes back to kind of what I was saying a little bit on the, 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 the big data, the world that we live in. It's like more and more we're going to be just inundated with content and data and information. And I, I think, you know, the, the good news is, is that – what I hope is that it actually strengthens human relationships and human bonds because in that world, it's, you know, how are you going to establish trust? How do you find trust? How do you know what to trust? And, and I think that that it's going to drive us more uh, to look to other people as, you know, as, you know, where we anchor our trust. And so, you know, companies that want to, I think grow in that kind of an environment need to really take a strong look at like their social media aspects, you know, how they're promoting their employees as brand ambassadors and brand storytellers and really leveraging the power of human relationships uh, in, you know, their efforts to grow their enterprises. Yeah. Yeah. I agree completely. I mean, people buy people at the end of the day, don't they? And Mm -hmm. you know, I've got some other figures actually from entrepreneur.com, which is, which supports everything you've just said. They, they actually found that 500, there was a 561% more reach from employees sharing brand messaging than Mm -hmm. brand accounts, right? Mm -hmm. 24 times more frequently that content was shared by employees sharing it. So, so people were sharing it 24 times more than actually you, when it was on a brand account. And there, was, there, was eight, there were eight times more engagement uh, created from the employees versus the brand account. So, mm-hmm. you know, it is, it is, it is quite, quite incredible, really. But, but I think the main thing is actually making sure that the people understand what the brand messaging actually is. You know, and there's a, there's a famous uh, a famous um, question that someone someone asked the cleaning lady at um, it was NASA, wasn't it? Have you heard right. that story? Yeah, so it was uh, one of the the chief engineers, I believe, had had um, 
it was closing up for the day and he came across the janitor who was sweeping the floor and he was sweeping the hallway and the chief engineer asked him, well, what are you doing? And he said, Oh, we're building rockets, sir. We're going to put a man on the moon, you know, and the janitor saw the simple act of him sweeping the floor. He saw that that was important because it helped the large organization in putting a man on the moon. And he internalized that organization's mission uh, into his own day-to-day -day activities as, as maybe as simple and humble as you know, they might seem on the outside. He recognized he had a part to play and that if he didn't do his part, somehow it, the, the organization would be deficit in being able to reach its goal. And that's the power of culture. And that's why, like, you know, you know, I think C-suite executives and, and, and business business drivers, you know, they ignore culture at their own peril because you can you can put together a brand message and, and tell your people, you know, this is what we want you to say about the company when you're talking to people, you know, but that may or may not work. It's when you reach into the hearts and minds of your employees and you get them to believe in the mission of what it is you're trying to achieve and you give them the latitude to kind of put that in their own words and, and, and share that with their networks of people, it becomes something much bigger than just, you know, a coordinated campaign. I mean, it takes on a life of its own and it has a, it has an air of authenticity and integrity that promotes trust and ultimately will help you achieve your goal. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just sitting here nodding away, really. <laughs> so, so more and more companies, right, seem to be taking an interest in thought leadership. How how would you how would you describe what it is and what what's actually driving interest in thought leadership? Yeah, so I think it's really you know it's an it's an ability to demonstrate your organization's intellectual muscle and the quality of your people. Um, you know, it's, it's a way to promote, produce and promote content that punches through the noise because there's, there's so much content being produced. And, you know, thought leadership, if done right, can allow you to, to kind of rise above and really engage an audience in a way that, you know, just simple facts and figures or, you know, product promotions and things won't. Um, you know, again, coming back to the, this this concept of, you know, uh, we live in an age of big data and it's only going to get bigger. Um, you know, it's it's that, that whole kind of uh, exponential growth of data. In that world, I, I, you know, it's my experience that trust more and more is really going to become a commodity. And, um, you know, how do you, you know, we, we see it, we see it in the news or, you know, there's all the concepts of like fake news and, you know, all kinds of like institutions and information, are, you know, constantly face questions and scrutiny, you know. And so trust, you know, is, is really hard to come by these days. And so I think that I look at thought leadership as a way that it allows your organization to establish trust. Um, it allows you to tell compelling you know, show, showcase compelling solutions to compelling problems and, you know, engage your audience in a way that they get to participate in the conversation without feeling like they're being sold to. It, it's, it's an, uh, you know, an integrity of, you know, problem solving. Um, and, and it harkens back to, you know, storytelling. It's, it's the idea of using stories you know, that everybody loves stories. Everybody loves a good story. Um, and, you know, so it's, it's using the principles that drive good storytelling uh, along with, you know, problem solving. Uh, and in a way that it, you know, builds affinity for your brand without your customers and your audience members feeling like you're just simply selling stuff at them. Rather, you're talking to them. Yeah, yeah. People hate being sold to. They hate it. It's uh, yeah, it's pretty awful experience as well when someone's sort of trying to push you to do something you, you don't want to do. Mm -hmm. you know? so, well, and, yeah, and that's why I think, like you were saying, with the social media and like you know, uh, uh, 
you know, you you find that to be so much more effective than like, you know, AdWords and, you know, banner ads and, and a lot of like our, you know, our traditional marketing methods are not as effective as they once were because people, the audience is, is so much so much more sophisticated these days yeah you know and we live in an age you know we live in an age of like uh tivo and dvrs and stuff so you know you record your favorite shows and then you blow past all the advertising yeah. and you know you think about all the advertising dollars that go into you know that the go into to that kind of the broadcast advertising that gets ignored or you know it's it's your your customers are becoming much more savvy to um you know their rights as a consumer not to have to like put up with being sold to so you know you've got to be more you've got to be more sophisticated and uh, you know i think at, at the end of the day more collaborative yeah. in um how you're selling you know you're telling your story and um you know uh how you're reaching your audience yeah yeah, well, I think uh, certainly over the next few years, there, there, well, even now, there is a much more data-led approach to storytelling, no doubt about it, and the analysis of the words that are being used and this sort of stuff. But that's that's another conversation in itself, really. That's a big, you know, we could talk about that for half an hour, um, I'm sure. <laughs> but how how would you describe your approach then to content creation uh, in a commercial setting, Paul? So I would say, you know, what I look for is, you know, when I put together stories is really to try to like provide a compelling solution to a compelling problem. And, uh, you know, in a way that kind of showcases what our organization can do, a few others can or could, but then also highlight the people that do that. Um, again, I, you know, I just, I can't speak. I can't hit on it enough how important it is to to showcase your people and and show the people that are behind um, creating the solutions. Right. Um, when I when I put together you know stories and you know for instance we we did a project on artificial intelligence uh, at a at a previous employer of mine the employer did a lot of terrific work on artificial intelligence in the, the legal sphere and the tax sphere and and also uh in financial services you know so and it would be easy to kind of just hit on you know the great work that they did you know from a product standpoint and the solutions that they were uh, creating and that's that's really what our marketing organization was for was to kind of hi highlight the products and solutions mm -hmm. rather what I wanted to do was you know pull together a number of like thought leaders and influencers from across the industry and that includes authors and professors suite c-suite um, you know executives from different like tech companies and you know financial services companies and really just try to pull together a cross-section of a, a couple dozen um, experts who would like for instance approach say a topic like artificial intelligence from very different viewpoints and package that all together uh, in a campaign so that our you know our audience could see you know they could get a number of viewpoints on you know on what artificial intelligence is what it will mean for us as a society but then also you know as a as you know consumers and, and commercial professionals yeah. and, and get those perspectives but then also the 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 thread through all of that was you know our you know our companies kind of you know was at the center of it you know showcasing how we were you know in the mix of this conversation with all these different you know fantastic people and you know the questions that you know we're asking and, and the dialogues that we're having, it kind of demonstrates, you know, our place, you know, that we have a place at the table with these folks that, you know, are recognized across the industry as, you know, as, you know, world-class, uh, you know, influencers and, and leaders. And so, you know, I think that's, that's my approach is, is kind of a collaborative approach you know, showcasing people and trying to like really expand the dialogue and the discussion. So it's not just like, you know, you have a problem, we have a solution, you know, kind of a typical sort of marketing approach, but rather, you know, let's, let's really kind of blow this out and explore the topic 
and show you that, you know, as a company, you know, we're, we're going to, we're going to be, we're going to try to stay ahead of you, our customer, you know, that we're really thinking about these large scale problems so that we can solve them. Um, you know, it, it, trying to help you, you know, we'll, we'll be there just around the corner and, you know, we're going to try to, um, you know, we're, we're try to stay ahead of you just a step or two ahead of you in the future. And we're going to try to bring you along with us, if that oh, makes sense. Right. So, so basically each one of those individual people would have, would have uh, educated the market, right. And educated your potential customers to, to knowing that you were obviously the right solution, right. So that they would, they would buy you. So it's, it's a bit like an, inf- it's really an influencer marketing kind of approach, but cause we have influencers, right. And we do influencer marketing campaigns and this sort of stuff, but right. You're talking about something that really is a deep dive, aren't you, into into that information more so? Yeah, and I, you know, and I also try to do it a bit of a mix where it was like some of the folks that we talked to, where it very clearly, like you know, it was very close to like where our customers were at in terms of like you know a, a, a market need, right? So you know, some of these interviews could talk about like solutions or or problems that our customers would be faced with now right. and in some of the interviews they're really you know i i kind of i would say they were kind of more for fun um right. because like they're dealing with issues or problems that are going to be years down the road um it's more speculative it's not quite so you know um brass tax rather it's just more kind of interesting kind of more what if and it's the reason for that is it's you know don't take your customers so literal that they just they have a problem you have to solve the problem and there it is i mean they're people they have interests they're curious they want to know things they want to learn things and so you know be playful you know have that kind of flexibility to recognize that you know business people too i mean it obviously they want to they want to follow trends. They want to, you know, stay up on, on the market. They want to know things that are, are relevant for the business, but they, you know, they're also curious human beings. And so recognize that and, and weave in some storytelling that is, uh, allows you to, to have some fun and kind of ask some what if larger questions. And when you put it all together, you know, it's, allows you to create a campaign where you're it's a mix it's a mix of i'm i'm at, i'm trying to help you answer some brass tacks day to day like questions that are, you're going to be faced with now but then also we're going to you know pull back the curtain a little further and look speculatively at the future um and and have a little fun with it and that kind of taps into the social sharing aspect of content you know and i mean it sounds a little casual, but it, it's the idea of like cool content. Like, oh, that was a cool story. I want to share that with my network. Well, I don't, I don't think it's casual at all. If you're boring, no one wants to read it. And, right. and that's my problem. That's my problem. Not as in I'm boring. I try not to be boring. <laughs> <Of> <laughs> but at the end of the day, yeah, there is so much content being created. Um, the The standard of written content and actually podcasts videos is actually quite low so in order for you to differentiate yourself you need you need to create amazing content right i mean that's that's what we're talking about here isn't it Mm -hmm. no for sure i mean and it's you know honestly it's uh, you, you gotta you gotta recognize your audience right it's at least in the united states and i think this is a global trend but there is for the first time in business history, we're dealing with a workforce where there are five generations in the workforce, you know, going back to, um, you know, the, um, the greatest generation and the baby boomers all the way to the millennials. And, you know, so your audiences are very different and, and what may have worked for say, you know, the greatest generation, what we, you know, the, our, the generation, our grandparents and, and their parents, you know, whatever, what may have worked for them um, in terms of like, you know, content is not necessarily the same content that's going to work for a millennial or digital natives. And so, um, you know, there's, 
life has changed. There's a lot greater emphasis. You know, there's, there's more leisure time now, I think, than probably ever in human history. Um, there's, there's much more time for people to be able to, to learn things, to explore, uh, and to, to look, you know, for that cool content to share that. And so, you know, you have to, you have to know your audience. You have to know these are the folks, particularly the millennials and, and digital natives and stuff. These are the folks that are more and more uh, taking, you know, command positions in business. And they are the decision makers. And so, you know, there's much greater emphasis, like you said, on not being boring, you know, and, and providing content that is going to be relevant and interesting and, and and, and gets them excited and motivated about you as an organization. You know, I, I very, most of the time I would say people don't really get excited about products quite so much as they get excited about an overall brand experience. And, right. um, you know, Apple, Apple makes, you know, the, they make iPhones, they make cell phones, uh, smartphones, you know, there's others that make smartphones too, but you know, there's that, there's that mystique around Apple. Um, and, and it's, you kind of buy into the Apple experience. It's not just their smartphones or their iPads, but it's, it's the whole Apple thing. And, you know, that is a way of that, that kind of branding and that kind of thought leadership and marketing content, all of that helps differentiate them. And, you know, we kind of stand up Apple as one of the, uh, as kind of a paradigm there, but you know, any company can really achieve that in their space. You know, if they have that commitment to like really knowing and engaging with their customers in a way that's authentic. Um, it doesn't feel like you're necessarily being sold to, but it, it's recognizing you have to do something to be true to yourself so that it inculcates trust in your, your audience and they come back and they, they want to participate with you. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So there are different points of view on how much emphasis an organization should place on individual spokespersons mm. versus the brand or its products and solutions, right? So when producing thought leadership content, what, what is your take on what constitutes the right balance between brand content and spokes, spokespeople? So, yeah, you know, it's been my experience that in working with different entities, you know, there's, there's, there are different takes on, on that topic. Um, some companies are very, I would say, they're very reticent about, you know, leveraging their, their rank and file employees um, as brand spokespersons. Um, you know, they, they take kind of, a, I guess what I would say, a, a typically or traditionally conservative view that you know the spokespersons for the brand should be um you know small in number c-suite kind of highly positioned they're people that the brand is heavily invested in and that are not quite as likely to jump ship as it were as opposed to say like more of a mid-level person uh, right. who, who may be here today and gone tomorrow and that kind of thing and right. you know particularly when you're putting marketing content together and you're investing in that you know then it's like well you know we put this money toward this person and then they left and now we can't you know this idea that you can't use that content i i say i take the other view i think you know it's you know people i come back to uh uh, the tr a trust barometer that uh, Edelman Research uh, puts out every year. Um, they Edelman is a research firm puts out this thing called the trust barometer uh, each year, in which they tackle, you know, the whole concept of trust, trustworthiness, uh, you know, people's people's trustworthiness in governments and in corporations and organizations, you know, and executives and and whatnot and. Each year when they do this, uh, when they poll people, by and large, uh, corporate like employees, rank and file employees really like well outpace executives in terms of trustworthiness. Like people kind of, I guess audiences, again, sophisticated enough to kind of take a skeptical view on messaging when it's delivered by an executive or somebody who, you know, is, you know, obviously heavily incentivized to kind of toe the company line but yeah. audiences are, are much more 
much more willing to believe and lend trust to rank and file employees because I think there's a, a strong element of like identification there. You know, identify with that person. That's that's a regular Joe. You know, I you know that that person is is more trustworthy than you know, say the guy in the suit who, you know, is in the corner office and, you know, I'm very skeptical of him. And so I think that, you know, you can, as an organization, really, you can really leverage the power of that, um, uh, of leveraging your employees to help as brand ambassadors to share your story. You know, we also live in a, a, a much more diverse world, you know, where diversity is really celebrated. Uh, you know, we live in a world where people want to hear a multitude of experiences and voices. And so, you know, you should leverage that and, and help those people in your company be your brand ambassadors and kind of help, you know, tell your story. And, you know, by doing that, that really lends itself to the whole social sharing aspect. Yeah. And like you were alluding to earlier, you know, that then leads to a much greater increase in like, you know, top of funnel uh, sales and leads because, you know, you're really casting the net much wider. Yeah. Yeah. There are, I mean, there are massive programs that are running, aren't there around social sharing and this kind of stuff, but I think the main problem is time and actually people, people have uh, a job to do, you know, so taking the time out to do social media can be a bit of a sort of distraction for them. I think making that easy is, is certainly the way to go, but in in terms of in terms of um, when producing content, right? Mm -hmm. should, should a company be reticent about including other brands, companies, or external spokespeople? Mm -hmm. um, uh, because it, surely it, it may detract from the author organization's messaging, right? Potentially. Well, I think there is that there is that can be that concern um because obviously you know there is this kind of it, it's natural to like want to put your company first and promote your company and and kind of showcase your company as the end all be all in terms of ideas but what i have found is that you actually you know there's there's a lot of power in in collaborating and cross promoting particularly with like key influencers um uh you know on certain topics and this is where you know and we can get into this but this is where like when you use things like keywords and search engine optimization and stuff and oh, oh sorry i just had to yawn there <laughs> you start <laughs> looking at, at data <laughs> analytics but you can start seeing who the key um who the key people are uh, you know, on a certain topic who are, you know, like influencing the market, yeah. you know, I, I would say when you, um, you know, when you collaborate with other companies and with key influencers and stuff, then you are, you are, you're tapping into their, you know, their audience base as much as they're tapping into yours. And um, so, you know, case in point, you know, we, we did a program where we interviewed a number of people around uh, data privacy and this was for um, you know in in advance of the GDPR going into effect on May mm -hmm. uh, of May 2018 and you know so the company I was working for we had a you know certain amount a couple hundred thousand folks that were on Twitter but when you um, you know, we, we interviewed about two dozen, you know, influencers and executives from other organizations. We were able to expand that reach uh, on Twitter to about 2 million people, right. you know. So those were like a whole lot of people that we weren't necessarily reaching on a normal basis through just our own social media efforts. And, you know, those were people that were being invited to come to our web property, you know, to see our, our interview with the, the person that, you know, that we were you know interviewing or the people we were interviewing right. and while they're on our site you know looking at the content looking at these you know the people the interviews they're also being exposed to our products and services and our other content and so i i think the lesson there is that you know when you can expand um your you know your discussion to include you know other companies and other brands you know, it's the, the, the tide rises all boats. It helps, it helps them and it helps you. And so you shouldn't be afraid of like, 
you know, you shouldn't have to feel like you, your company has all the answers. You know, it's recognizing, again, the world we live in. You know, not, no one of us is as smart as all of us. And so, and, you know, your audience is sophisticated enough to know that. And in fact, I think they appreciate that, you know, that you, you have that network of, you know, other companies and key influencers that you collaborate with. And, and it kind of, sh it kind of, you know, elevates your standing, you know, because you're able to attract that kind of talent to the discussion. Yeah, I agree completely. It, it's, uh, it's leveraging their authority and credibility, isn't it? To make yourself or your business look, look better and more knowledgeable and, and, and everything else. It's a long, it's a long conversation. I've got one more question here and it's, it's, it's about keywords, which, you know, switches a lot of people off. As soon as they hear the word search engine optimization, they just, they just switch off and, and everything else. But it is important to get the traffic right. And it, because in, in essence, those, those keywords are questions that people are asking. I mean, that's in essence what a keyword is in, in simple terms, right? You know, we're not, we're not going to go into the differences of different types of keywords and all this sort of, sort of technical stuff. But what role do you see things such as keywords and SEO playing in content creation? And how should communicators effectively use them? rather than being used by them? So I think that they are very important. I, I think that, you know, I, I will confess that I have had to learn over this course of my career, and I'm not a highly technical person, but I've had to learn over the course of my career not to be afraid of keywords and SEO and, and you know, data analytics to help drive storytelling. You know, I, I come at it, it's like I just – you know, at the end of the day, I want to tell good stories, you know, hopefully, hopefully good stories. So that's, that's what gets me excited. But data analytics and SEO are, are really important in an age of big data because they're useful in identifying, you know, influencers that you'd want to collaborate with and topics that you want to tackle. Um, but you got to take care not to ape them it too closely you know, or else you can get lost in the noise. So a case in point, like, you know, this year we've done some campaigns around data privacy and around artificial intelligence. And, you know, in looking at, we, we looked at like social media reports to see who, who was, was trending highly on, you know, on, on discussions in social media around artificial intelligence or data privacy. You know, who were people following and so that helped helped us create a list of, you know, I mean, we knew some of the people that we wanted to talk to about AI, but then it also helped us understand better, you know, who are the people out there that people in the larger in the larger world are really following and are really interested in hearing from. And so, you know, that was kind of a smart way for us to be able to tap into that that interest in terms of um, you know, identifying interviewees that we could talk to. Uh, keywords, you know, when you, you look up like artificial intelligence, you know, there's a host of keywords around it, like, you know, machine learning and data science and, you know, natural language processing. And, and there's all kinds of different buzzwords that go into, into AI. So when you look at, you look at your keywords and you look at how, you know, how they perform um, like how people are searching for them, it can help you, you know, understand better, like how you could take, you know, a large topic like artificial intelligence. It's a big umbrella topic. There's any host of ways you can attack it. Keywords help you kind of slice it up a bit into more digestible parts. So you can, you can see like, oh, well, people have an interest in, for instance, they want to, they want to talk about AI in terms of, you know, how it can support any money laundering efforts or people want to understand AI and how it can help with supply chain management and that sort of thing. So, you know, using keywords and, and data analytics can help you better identify who to talk to and what, what topics you want to talk about. But what I would say is you – You've got to be somewhat judicious too, because you know you can, you know you can use a, 
keywords, you've got to be judicious that you don't fall into this trap of like being so close to them that it just gets lost in like, you know, say you do a topic like you, a keyword machine learning and you just, you use, you're focused on, you know, that, that term because it promotes, it, you know, seems to be ubiquitous. Well, if you don't have, if you're not coming at that topic in a way that is somewhat unique and compelling, you know, it's just going to get lost in like all the other stories about machine learning. It won't perform well. Uh, I guess is what I'm trying to say. So it's like, you've got to, you've got to use it intelligently, but not slavishly. I think that's the perfect place to finish. And thanks so much, Paul. Really appreciated having you on the show. Thanks so much for listening. Please subscribe and wherever you prefer, share with your friends. And if you enjoyed the show, drop us a review on iTunes or wherever you listen. Thank you.